Welcome to this session titled Personal Polynomials for the TI-84 Plus CE Calculator. This is very much a recreational sort of mathematical thing to do. It doesn't have any real bearing on the real world, but it's just a bit of fun. The idea is you develop a polynomial that aligns to your name. It's kind of like a DNA or fingerprint of your own name, but represented mathematically. So, how does it work? Each letter of your name is assigned a value, according to its position in the alphabet. So A is 1, B is 2, C is 3, and so on. Now, the first letter in your name becomes our first point. So that would be 1, comma, whatever that letter is. So, if your name was Brian, then it would be 1, comma, 2, because B is the second letter of the alphabet. If your name was Chris, it would be 1, comma, 3 because C is the third letter of the alphabet. Then the second point aligns to the second letter of your name, and so on. And your personal polynomial must pass through each and every point in your name. Now that could be a really big polynomial if you have a very long name. So in some cases, check with your teacher. You may be able to abbreviate or shorten your name. So, let's do an example. There's all the letters of the alphabet, and in my case, my name's Peter, so my first point aligns to the 16th letter of the alphabet, being P, so my first point is 1, 16. 1 because P is the first letter of my name, and 16 because P is the 16th letter of the alphabet. So, our next letter is E. Well, E is the fifth letter of the alphabet, so point 2 becomes 2, comma, 5. 2 because E is the second letter of my name, and 5 because E is the fifth letter of the alphabet. So, of course, T is the next letter in my name. That's the twentieth letter in the alphabet. So the next point is 3, 20. And we've looked at E before, so that will just be 4, 5. And then finally, the R, which is the 18th letter of the alphabet, will become 518. Now I've got all the points that my polynomial needs to pass through. Now all we need to do is think about what sort of equation that might look like. OK, so let's start plotting some points. The polynomial will probably look something like this. I don't know what degree that is off the top of my head. So let's start with an easier problem. Let's suppose I only wanted to do the first two letters of my name, the P and the E. That would give me two points, so I could do that with a straight line. Now, to work out that equation, I'll start with the general equation of a straight line in the form y equals mx plus c. If I substitute in the first point, 1, 16, that would end up with 16 equals m plus c. That's substituting x equal 1 and y equals 16. Now I can substitute in the second point. Now I've got two equations with two unknowns, the m and the c. I can solve them simultaneously and get m equals negative 11 and c equals 25. And that looks about right. My straight line has a negative gradient, and the y-intercept looks to be somewhere between 20 and 30, so that looks pretty good. So let's make the problem a little bit more difficult. Let's say I'm Pet instead of Peter. To do that, I could get a quadratic. I've got three points, and therefore a quadratic could be made so that it passes through all three points. So three points gives me a polynomial degree two. Two points, although simplistic, is a polynomial of degree one. So if I've got five points, it kind of makes sense that would be a polynomial of degree four. Now all I need to do is figure out how to generate that polynomial. Well, its general form would look something like that. So we can start to write equations, the same as we did when I just used the first two letters of my name. 
So if I substitute in 1 for x, then I can say p of 1 is equal to 16. So x being 1, x to the power of 4 is 1, x cubed is 1, x squared is 1, so my equation is pretty straightforward. a plus b plus c plus d plus e equals 16. My second point passes through 2, 5. So I need to do p of 2. In other words, substitute 2 in for x. Well, 2 to the power of 4 is 16, 2 cubed is 8, 2 squared is 4. So my equation this time looks like 16a plus 8b and so on. Now I can do the third point. That passes through 320, so p of 3 gives me that equation. p of 4 gives me that one. And finally, p of 5 gives me that one. Now I've got five equations and five unknowns. The five unknowns being a, b, c, d and e. If I can derive them, then I'll have my polynomial. So let's start with the first two equations. I could use those to eliminate e just by subtracting p of 2 from p of 1. In other words, p of 1 minus p of 2 would give me that. I've eliminated e. I could do the same to two other equations. For example, p2 and p3. And because the e's coefficient is 1, I can use exactly the same strategy and do p of 2 minus p of 3. And voila! I've got another equation without an e. I've now got two equations with only four variables. I still need more equations. Well, I've got more to play with. I can do p of 3 minus p of 4. That's three equations with four unknowns. And then finally, p of 4 minus p of 5. And that gives me that one. So I've now got four equations and four unknowns. So I could continue on along this path. However, there's a quicker way. Let's return to the original equations. Now imagine that I strip off all the letters, a, b, c, d, and e, and just look at the coefficients. What we get is something that looks like an array, or dare I say it, matrix. So the first column were all the coefficients of a, the second column, the coefficients of b, and c, and d, and e. In the last column, we have the y values, 16, 5, 25, and 18. On the calculator, we can use a special command called row reduction in echelon form. And what this does is, in essence, solve our simultaneous equations with almost just the stroke of a key. It's pretty cool. So let's swap to the calculator to see how to do this. So the first thing we need to do is create a matrix. I'll press second function and then the x to the negative one, which is our matrix menu. And I'm going to set up matrix A. So I need to edit its current dimensions. I need the matrix to have five rows and six columns. Now, the first row is all the coefficients 1, 1, 1, 1, that being 1a plus 1b plus 1c plus 1d. And if you remember, the last one was the y value, aligned to p in this case, so that's 16. Now, the next row, I had the second point, and that would be 2 to the 4, which is 16. And then 2 cubed, 2 squared, and then just 2, 1, and then the y value, which was 5. In other words, the letter E. The next row is 81, 27, 9, 3, 1, and the letter T, which was 20. 
Now we've got the fourth row, so that's 4 to the power of 4, which is 256, 4 cubed, 4 squared, 4, 4 to the naught if you like, and then E, which was the, uh, the fifth letter of the alphabet. And now our final row, that is our fifth point, and there's our coefficients there, and the R is the 18th letter of the alphabet. So we've set up our matrix. Five rows, six columns. I'll quit out of here. Now, it's a matrix command that we're looking for, so I'll go back to the matrix menu. And if I go across to the maths tools, I'm not editing a matrix this time, I'm using some mathematical tools right down near the bottom of the list, and I've just hit the up arrow. There it is, option B, row reduction in echelon form. So I'll select that one, and I'll apply that to matrix A. So let's recall matrix A, and press enter. So what do all of these values mean? Notice there's a 1 in the first row, in the first column. That means that that's our value for A, being 1A is equal to 4.75. In the second row, we see a 1 in the B column. So being 1B is equal to negative 56.83. So C equals 235.25, D equals minus 390, and E is 223. I've got all the values that I need. I've solved the simultaneous equations. What I now need to do is get those values and put them into my Y equals editor and type out the equation. Well, if I want to get it really accurate, I want more than just 4.7. And then 4.75. And same with the B. I need the negative 56.833. I could convert them all to fractions. That's a little bit messy and a little bit time consuming. So I'm going to show you another trick. I'm going to get that result. This one here. And I'm going to store that result. It's a matrix. So let's just store it as a matrix. I'm going to store that in matrix B. And here's our tip for the day. If I want to access the values in the sixth column, so say row one, column six, there's a neat trick, you ready? Second value, or second function rather, let's recall matrix B, and I put in its reference. That is, I want the value in row one, column six. And there it is. Now I know I could have typed out 4.75 a bit quicker, but bear with me. I'm going to store that as A. Now I'll go up and retrieve the value in the second row. Again, the sixth column, and I'll store that in B. And I'll do the same again. Oops, too far. And I'll get the third row, which aligns to C. So I'll store that in C. And I've still got D and E to go. So let's store that one in D. That would be in the fourth row. And the last one. I want that stored in E. And it's in the fifth row, that is the fifth point. So now I've got those values stored in their entirety in A, B, C, D, and E. So let's go to the Y equals editor, and I'll type in A, X to the power of 4, plus cx squared plus dx plus e. Now, I could have done that a different way. I could have said, recall the value of a and put my 
x to the power of 4 plus recall the value of b x cubed plus recall the value of c x squared and keep on going but as you can see the equation kind of disappears off the screen having all of these decimal places means that our equation ends up really long I kind of like the way it's done up here it's simple and straightforward now we need to think about the window settings so I'll press window I've set these up earlier but let's just go through them to begin with so I know that I need the x values of 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Now I don't want those right on the edge of the screen, so I'm using two points to the left and two units to the right. So I've got negative 1 through to 7 and a scale of 1. So that's those values. As for the y values, they're a bit of a guess really. I might try 150 for the maximum y value. I don't think my function's going to dip too low because remembering all of my other values are positive. So it needs a little, a little room if you like to slow down, turn around and come back. But I don't think it needs too much room. And if I'm going from minus 25 to 150, I don't think I need a scale any smaller than 25. My X resolution I've set as 1 and you'll see what that does in just a moment. This delta X value that's kind of set based on these values up here. So let's go ahead and press graph. And there's my polynomial. Now that's drawn reasonably quickly, but here's another tip. If you want to draw that polynomial a little bit faster, you can change the X resolution to 3 or 4 or even 5. And you'll notice that it draws so fast you can barely notice it. So it's good if you just want to see where the graph is. So in my case, I'm thinking I don't need to go up to 150 on the y-axis. So I'm going to run that back to 100 and you'll see the graph generates pretty quick. If I change the X resolution to 1 because I want a little bit more detail on it, you can see it figuring it out and drawing it. So that's my polynomial. I might want to check to make sure it really is passing through the points that I've selected for my name. There's a couple of ways we can do this. Trace is one option. Now, at the moment, it's just traced that at x equals 3. If I just type in 1, it says it passes through the point 1, 16, which is correct. What about if x is 2? Or 3? Or 4? Or 5? Of course, I could have also done a table of values and just read them off from here. It's going through 1, 16, 2, 5, 3, 20, 4, 5, and 5, 18. So my polynomial is correct. And one more space we could have done that. Alpha, F4, that's our shortcut to bring up our Y variables. And I could calculate Y1 of 1. And then Y1 of 2, and Y1 of 3, and so on, to check them. Now another question that you're often asked in this problem, or these types of problems, is to find the x-axis intercepts. So let's go back to the graph, and I can see that it seems to be somewhere between x equals 1 and x equals 2. So I'm going to zoom in on that region. So zoom, and I'm going to use zoom box. It's very handy for this sort of problem. I can just arrow across to the left, and it's kind of like a selection tool I want to just select the part of the graph that I'm interested in. So somewhere between here and here. I don't need to be too accurate. That's going to fill up my entire screen. Now, if I press the trace key, I can get pretty close to the x-axis intercept. It's about 1.4. Or 1.41 in between those two values or if I press second calculate and select option 2 which is 0 I can move a little to the left 
a little to the right and throw in a guess somewhere in between and there it is. The zero occurs at 1.4119158 and so on. And just to return or reiterate what we did before, if I jump back to the home screen and now I'm going to use Y1 of X because watch what happens when I press X now. It's the value that we just calculated. So if I want to substitute that into my function, y1 of x, it should produce 0. And there we have it. So I need to go on and find out all the other x-axis intercepts. Well, at the moment, I could pick up this other one. But you can do that for yourselves. But what I will do is show you how to quickly get back to the previous window that is the previous window settings that I had. If I press the zoom key, it's not listed in here, it's listed across under zoom memory. This is a great place where you can store specific window settings and recall them. Or in this case, just recall the previous window setting, so zoom previous option one. And now I've got back the window settings that I started with. And then I could zoom in on other sections of the graph. Now that we've done all of this work, imagine class is just about to finish and you might want to use your calculator in another class. So here's a couple of quick tips. We've got an equation, a graph and some window settings. We might want to save them. There's this really cool feature called graphical database. So let's jump out of the graph and press second function and the program menu which is where the draw command is and we want to store a graphical database option 3. It needs to know where we're going to store that so we press variables and you can see option 3 again is graphical database and I'll store that in the first graphical database. So. I'll head off to my other class and I need to clear everything out of equation 1 and perhaps even just zoom to a different window setting. So I'll choose zoom 4. Very different. My equation's gone and so is my graph. But I can recall them. If I go back to the same draw menu and next to where the store graphical database was, there's an option to recall graphical database, option 4. Now, my variables menu, graphical database, and graphical database number one is where I stored it. Press enter. Press y equals, and I can see I've got my equation back. And if I press the window key, I can see that I've also got all the window settings, and my graph is back. So it's a great place to store a bunch of equations. You can store nine or 10 equations in there, and all your window settings. But in my case, I've also got A, B, C, D, and E being used. So if somebody changes, or if I change the A, B, C, and D values, then I'll get a different graph. So there's another option as well. I'll go to second memory, and option eight, which is group. I'm gonna create a new group. I'm gonna call this one My Poly. You can see that the cursor has the alpha sign flashing, which means we're ready to just start typing letters. So I'll go my poly. Press enter. I'm going to choose option two, all minus. So now I could store the graphical database. That would be a neat way to do it. I'll arrow down and you can see I can save the matrices. I might find those useful to retain. And I can save the equation in Y1. I can save the window settings. And I can save the values of A, B, C, D, and E. So I've stored my equation. 
I've stored the values A, B, C, D and E, the window settings, and I've also stored the matrices. So I've stored quite a lot. Then I go across to Done and press Enter. Now let's see what happens. Again, I'll clear off my equation. I'll change the window settings. So far the same as before. But now I'm just going to store 0 in A. And I'll store a 0 in B. You get the general idea. So now even if I put my equation back, it wouldn't be correct because the values of A, B and C are not the same anymore. But check this out. Second memory. I'll go down to Group, but this time I'll select Ungroup. And the group that I created was called My Poly. Do you want to overwrite all the things stored in Matrix A? I sure do. And in fact, I'll overwrite all the things. Now I can go back here. Y equals my equations back. My window settings are back. But check this out. The value stored in A, it's back as well. And the value in B, it's also been returned. And C, and so on. So my graph is back. That's a group file. Very handy. The personal polynomials task requires us to explore some other names. So I'm going to have a look at my surname, Fox. Now, the first letter is F, so that's the sixth letter of the alphabet. O is the 15th and X is the 24th. Interesting that they all fall into a column. So let's see if we can get the equation. I'm thinking three points, probably quadratic. So let's check it out. I'll quit out of my graph screen, and it's time to set up another matrix. So we'll edit this matrix A, and given that I've got three points, I'll need three rows and four columns. The first row is not bad, but F is the sixth letter of the alphabet, and the next row is going to be two squared, two, one, and O is the 15th letter of the alphabet. And then the third row, so I've got 3 squared is 9, 3, then 1, and X is the 24th letter of the alphabet. So now I can try my row reduction to solve these simultaneous equations. Row reduction on matrix A. And we see an interesting result, remembering that the 1 in the top left corner of that matrix refers to A, the coefficient of A being 6.2 by 10 to the minus 13. Well, that's pretty close to 0. So it suggests that the equation for the name Fox is 9x minus 3. But that's linear. If you think about how those letters formed in that table, they were the same distance apart. So when I go from F to O, O is nine letters further down. And X is nine letters further on from O. So in fact, a straight line equation is all that is required for my name, or at least my surname. So not all polynomials have a degree one less than the quantity of letters. Now let's have a look at another name. A friend of mine has a child called Ava. So her coordinates would be 1, 1, 2, 22, and 3, 1. I'm thinking a quadratic would be fine here. Now notice something about Ava's name. It's something we call a palindrome, or it's palindromic. It's the same going forward as it is going backwards, so there's a, a degree of symmetry about it. So do we see that symmetry in the equation? Let's find out. So, we'll set up the matrix again, and this is the best bit. I had a 3x4 matrix before, and it's the same dimensions. The only parts that I need to change is the values in this last column. So that's a 1, because A is the first letter of the alphabet, and 
V is a 20 second letter of the alphabet and again A being the first. So I'll hop out of there and I'll cheat a little bit here. I'll just scroll up and get the same command back. And now we've got our equation for Ava. Now I could go through and recall those values again like I did in the past. However, I'm pretty sure with integer values I can just remember those. So again to my y equals editor, I'll switch that first equation off. And let's see if we can type in Ava's equation. She's a negative 21 x squared plus 84x minus 62. And there's Ava's equation. Notice that it's a parabola of course, but it's symmetric about the middle value. So the turning point is at 222. So just like Ava's name is symmetrical, a palindrome, her equation is also symmetrical. So what does that mean for someone else? Someone like Azza. Not a very common name, but we can see some symmetry in that because Azza has a palindromic name. But normally he would be a polynomial of degree 3 because he has four letters in his name. But cubics don't have a line of symmetry. They're symmetrical about a point through rotational symmetry. So I'm thinking Azza might actually be quadratic. Let's see what happens when we put Azza's details into our matrix. So I'll go back to our matrix and we'll need to change that up a bit this time. He has four letters in his name. So we'll need a four by five matrix. First row still pretty good. A is the first letter of the alphabet. And now we need to do 2 cubed, 2 squared, 2 and 1. And Z being the last letter of the alphabet. That's an easy one to remember. And now we've got 3 to the power of 3, 3 squared, 3 and 1. And the 26 again. And then the fourth letter, so that's 4 cubed which is 64, 4 squared, 4, 1, and back to A again. Now let's get Azza's equation. And we can see once again that the first coefficient, 1.1 by 10 to the minus 12, was pretty close to 0. So in fact, Azza is also a quadratic. Negative 12.5x squared plus 62.5x minus 49. So our personal polynomials asks us to explore palindromic names and come up with some patterns about what happens to the degree of the polynomial for certain palindromic names. And the last section looks at how often these people intersect or meet. So Andrea and Andrew. Do we need to find out their entire equation? Or do we know where they're going to meet? Let's think about that. They'll have the point A in common. And N. And D. And R. And E. So in fact we know five points where they're going to cross straight away. They're not going to intersect at their last point. But what happens to the tail end of that polynomial? Well, that's up to you to explore. That's all for this session. Good luck with your personal polynomials investigation, and thanks for watching.